everybody seeing the the screen green there green screen yes okay cool hold on a minute here one two three four five okay nice okay well welcome to the end of the third week we had a holiday this monday so this is the, our fifth lecture third week into the third week we have 16 weeks of lecturing that includes uh exam final exam so we are finishing this we're about 20 percent done almost a little bit less than 20 percent done that's good that's good um it feels good to make some progress today is going to be uh depending on what you want to call it i like to if you wish to give me your feedback later on uh you know to our channel will be fine it could be hard it could be fascinating it could be interesting it could be wow <laughs> It could be wow too, meaning wow, never seen this math or this kind of math. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do in here is, I believe that if we go over here, uh, we were uh, derivation of the numerical diffusion coefficient of the Maskinga method. This is part of our book, our our hydrology book. Uh, what happened is this, and I'm going to give you a little bit of the history. The Maskingam was around since 1938. The Muskingum Kunge came out in 1969, uh, and it was discovered basically by the British, who in 1975, they published a big book and made a big fuss about the Muskingum Kunge. That's when I kind of picked it up after the British. Uh, Mr. Price out of uh, Wallingford was, I think, the author of that report. Uh, and so it came up. And it is, as you guys probably already know, it's very intricate. The Muskingum is very simple. It's kind of too simple, actually, because it really doesn't explain a whole lot. But the Muskingum Kunge explains just about everything. So we felt, I felt that since we were coming up in our book uh, featuring the Muskingum Kunge as the way to go in 1989, I felt that we had to tell everything, meaning so that people wouldn't say, oh, you know, where'd you get this stuff? I don't understand it. So I decided to put the derivation of the numerical diffusion coefficient of the muskingum kunge method in the appendix, in one of the appendices of my book, Appendix B. So I'm going to go over the math quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We have a lot of stuff to cover. You are welcome to look at it carefully as time permits, as you're busy and so forth. Uh, obviously, uh, this stuff was done by Kunch, was not published by Kunch. Kunch just said, let's do this, and this is the answer. So we had to come up and do it if we wanted to show it, right? And we did. As a matter of fact, this derivation explains only the derivation of the second order, which is what Kunch, second order term, which is what Kunch did, explain for us how, how we could calculate the X coefficient, which is the second order. Uh, nobody to this date has done a third order on the Muskingum Kunch. I tried it one time, but failed, and I obviously not gonna do it now, uh, but that remains to be done. And I mentioned that the third order, uh, because uh, Doug, and we're gonna read Doug today, uh, had talked about a, the third order extensively as a matter of fact. Now, I happen to believe that the third order is nice, but probably not useful. This, with the second order, you will cover all the practice. If you really want to do some heavy research in this area, which as you know, it's called flood routing. It's part of numerical hydraulics. Um, then you could go to the third order. But like I said, Kunch, Kunch didn't go to the third order. We tried at one time, but have not completed the work and so forth. It's very complicated mathematics, the third order. Now the second order is here. So what Kanch did is he said he was going to expand the grid function, in other words, the discrete function in Taylor series about point J, delta X, and delta T. And there's the graph in there that explains it. So he's got a bunch of equations in here. And I don't, um, I'm not asking you to look at this. Well, you know, you can do whatever you want with this piece of information, but it is not easy. Okay, it was not easy for us when we did it for the first time back uh, in the middle 80s before we wrote the book. And I, like I said, I decided to put it in an, in an appendix so as to not to scare people. Uh, because when people buy a book, if they, buy, if they look at the book and they can't read it, they don't buy it. No matter how good the book is. 
<laughs> we knew that from the beginning. Okay, you, you can be too good, okay? Uh, also, you can be too bad, obviously, right? So we try to strike a middle ground and we put this stuff in the appendix. We expand the grid function in Taylor series about point, point Jn, J delta X, N delta T. It's a discrete function. And we get this, Qjn plus one equal to Qjn, et cetera, plus the first derivative and the second derivative and a third order term that we're going to neglect later on because we're only doing first and second order. Okay, and the third order, you could put the third order in here if you wanted to, but then it'll get really, really messy. And uh, we have done this calculation. I think I mentioned to you the other day that uh, I had it in my files and three years ago, I don't know, accidentally or for whatever reason, we just we just threw it away. So if we wanted to redo it, then we, it would have to be redone. But I don't think so. We're not going to do this in the near future. For the third order, for the second order, it was done, and it is in the book. It's in the blue book, in my, my uh, engineering hydrology book, 1989. So this is it. We expand the grid function, and we go through the algebra. And allow me, I'm just going to go fast on this. I don't intend to spend a lot of time on it. Substituting equations B1 to B4, it's all explained in there very carefully. It's equations B1 to B4, so if you wanted to do the algebra, you could do it. Equa into equation 1094, which is in chapter 10, and neglecting third order terms in here, in chapter 1094 is right here. 1094 is the equation that defines the Muskingum and Muskingum Gunch. This equation is part of my book. That's my book, by the way. Okay, so we have substituted in 1094, and we get B5, appendix B5 equation. And, and here, right here, we derive the, we define the current number. And at this point, I'm going to talk about the current number. The current number uh, shows up every time you have a, the solution of a, of a um, what do you call this, uh, uh, kinematic, uh, the kinematic term, show, the first order, the first order. The first order term, when it's dis discretized, it, it, it always gives rise to the current number, where the current number is the ratio of physical celerity to grid, what it's called grid celerity. So over here, the, the C, capital C, is this physical celerity over, over the grid celerity. The grid celerity is delta X over delta T. It's a fundamental concept. But when you write it as the current number, the delta T, which was in the denominator, shows up in the numerator. So this is the current number. Who, whom do we owe the current number? There was a French, uh, no, no, excuse me, German. German scientist in 1928, wrote a paper uh, with co-authors, with co-authors Louis and Friedrichs. And it's referred to in the literature of computational fluid dynamics as the CFL condition, numerical condition. CFL for Courant Friedrichs Louis. But over the years, people have started to drop the, the other two gentlemen. And nowadays, in our field, we call it the Courant number which is exactly not to be, uh, it's not exactly the same as the Courant Friedrichs Louis for the reason the Courant Friedrichs Louis was using the Lagrange celerity and we are using the Seddon celerity because we're calculating flat waves. We're not calculating gravity short laboratory waves. We're, that's not our interest. And we know that because of the S-curve. We know that in the middle of the S-curve, all the waves disappear, so you only have right and left, and the right is not floods. Only the left is floods, right? So that's the rationale for the current number. So we then express the derivatives uh, at grid points in terms of the derivatives at grid points at the lower grid points by means of Taylor series, as he said, and we substitute and neglect third order terms, and we get all this jazz in here, as you can see, extremely detailed stuff. And when then we divide by delta t and simplify, and we get this equation over here, b11. And then the first two terms, the first two terms of b11 are indeed the kinematic wave equation at a node, delta t, delta no, dq, dx, partial q with respect to t, and partial q with respect to x. That is the kinematic wave equation right here. So the rest must be the error of the approximation because it has to be zero. This is the error that came out from the expansion in Taylor series, okay? 
So, so the, the error of the approximation, we call it R, is this. Now we're going to do some simplifications in here, which is algebra. And we substitute and we rearrange and we get R equal to this, right? And comparing with the diffusion wave equation, of which I'm going to talk about later in a minute here, this equation in here, which, by the way, is the so-called Hayami equation. This equation, diffusion wave equation, was derived in 1951 by Hayami. Kanch derived this equation, B16, in 1969 for the approximation error of the discrete analog, right? So then uh, from here, it follows that the numerical diffusion, if you compare this R over here, and since this is the, this is the kinematic wave equation, then this nu sub H, which is, stands for hydraulic diffusivity, so the hydraulic diffusivity of Hayami, which is the coefficient of the second order term, which is usually expressed on the right of the equation, it's this, C delta X one half minus X. That's over here, C delta X one half minus X because it goes to the other side. It goes to the other side of the equation. Instead of X minus one half, one half minus X. So this is the famous Kanch formula. What Kanch wrote in his paper. Then then he, this, this is the numerical diffusion, but he, ha he had to proceed and equate that to the physical diffusion, which is Q over 2S sub O, which is the diffusion of Hayami. And then he ended up with the, the calculation, the way to calculate X. And that is in my book, by the way, in chapter, chapter nine of my book. It's clearly explained in there if you want to go back and take a look at it, of my hydrology book. So with that, then we have given credence to Kanch. We found out how he did it. This is one of the most famous formulas in hydraulics because it allows us to do a calculation with the Muskingum Kanch, really kind of simulating the, the kinematic diffusion waves. And we don't simulate dynamic waves because we say, we argue that they don't exist, that they disappear as Lighthead and Whittam said in his paper. So you see, it's a very useful method because we don't need to be in, we need to get in, we don't need to get entangled with the dynamic wave. And the word is entangled. The dynamic wave is difficult and so on and so forth. Uh, it can be done with Hegras, but even the people of, of Army Corps uh, had second thoughts about doing this. They for a long time dragged their feet on changing Hegras and adding the dynamic wave. Until in 1987, um, they called in Danny Fred, who told them that they should do it. And then at the same time, they called me and I said, well, you can do it. But I mean, keep in mind that it's not going to be useful for all the, all the cases. Danny said that it was. I said that it wasn't. Okay, that's why they confronted me with Danny over there. I know Danny in his inside mind, he thinks I'm correct. But the problem was that uh, he never said it. He just said, he kept arguing that his way was the only way to do it. The dynamic wave of, at that time it was called the Whopper. Then it, sub, it was succeeded by the Unbreak. And then right now, both of the, both have basic, basically disappeared and it, it has now been replaced. The de Whopper and the Unbreak were national weather service models, but it, they were replaced at the level of the Army Corps of Engineers with the Hegras, who took all kinds of phases. First, it was gradually very flow, then it was unsteady flow, then with sediment, Hegras has got about five or six features or options. But well, Hegras is the method to learn because that's the one that is really used in practice. And many of you or several, several of you are gonna choose that. Now, I do wanna ask you again that you have three choices. One is to, Take HECRAS project, HECRAS or HMS. I consider it to be the same kind of thing because you either or or both, you'll be using the consultants. Uh, or, or do not use HECRAS for whatever reason. I'm not arguing each one way or the other. And then you can work with me and we'll identify that, that the consultant will be Professor Fox if you don't use HECRAS. Okay. And then the third subject, which is the research. And I certainly do not expect all of you to jump on the research because it's difficult. Well, I don't think it's that difficult, particularly because you're going to have Professor Pons right next to you. But at any rate, you decide. 
You decide. It's your decision. Again, Hegras is the practical. Uh, non hegras is kind of theoretical. And the other one is advanced. Okay? So I'm stopping there as far as that is concerned. And like I said, if you have any questions uh, about the material, you can you can uh, radio me or send me a... Uh, well, i got to get rid of this. Okay. Send me a, a note. Okay. So in here... So that was the derivation of the Muskingum method. Now, the next paper is the Hayami paper. Now, I think I already mentioned to you that Professor Ponce doesn't know everything. Even though it may look like he does, he doesn't, okay? And there's a lot of things that in the literature that I have read and I don't understand. A lot of people write in a way that nobody can understand. So the Hayami paper is one of these papers like the Vedernikov paper, like 1945 Vedernikov paper, is basically unreadable, okay? We got the information from, from many other sources. Uh, and there's a lot of other things that uh, are that way. So our position is we study, we read, we make a lot of effort, but if we cannot understand something that we're reading, it's because we don't have the background. It's usually not because we're stupid, but, but because we don't have the background. And a case in point, the paper by Du would be one of those, and I'm going to get there eventually. But let me just got, go over Hayami first. Hayami, 1951. The, the, he was a gentleman, I believe a professor over in, to, uh, in not Tokyo, uh, Kyoto, Kyoto University in, in Japan. And he was the first one that ascribed a diffusion um, phenomena or actually a diffusion behavior to flood waves. And he did it in that paper, and we have posted for you only an extract. I only want you to read the first page. That's the important page. It's an extremely important page. I wouldn't want you to go to Hayami and read it in because there's no purpose to do that. We have actually improved the Hayami methodology with the Kant. The Kant improved the Hayami methodology without even mentioning. I do not believe Kant mentioned Hayami. He may have not known that Hayami existed. But Kanj was talking about the same subject. Okay, so I have this first page in here, Disaster Prevention Research Institute, Kyoto University, Japan, bulletins. They, this is an interesting paper because it's a bulletin number one. I believe this is paper number one. This And the subject is on the propagation of flood waves. So I want you to read this stuff carefully and understand it because it's extremely important. It is, it is one of the most important pages in hydraulics, particularly in flood routing and hydraulic engineering and numerical hydraulics. In natural rivers, the forms of the channels, the bed slopes, the breadth, meaning the width, the forms of cross sections are all very irregular and incessantly changing, truly, because the rivers are moving. There are architects or, your, or their own geometry. If they are alluvial rivers, they're actually doing that. They're, there's an interaction between the boundary and the flow. The boundary changes the flow and the flow changes the boundary. It is impossible to grasp them definitely. Yet the flow in rivers is steady or appears to be steady, nearly uniform in the broad means. The disturbances on the, of the flow caused by irregularities damp away within a few kilometers and have certain limited dimensions and durations. durations, durations. So there are disturbances, but they damp away. Is what he's saying. The stochastic character of the collective of these elementary disturbances causes a large scale longitudinal mixing, meaning diffusion. Everybody knows that mixing means diffusion. He should have said, if I had written this, I would have said causes a large scale longitudinal diffusion, but I wasn't writing it, okay? The stochastic character of the collective of these elementary disturbances causes a large scale longitudinal mixing. The order of magnitude of the diffusion coefficient, here we go. He's basically saying that there's mixing that produces steadiness and that that mixing is, uh, can be uh, ascribed a diffusion mechanism that can be solved with the diffusion equation. Diffusion was not invented by Hayami. That would be a, a big call. What Hayami did was bring diffusion into hydraulics, which is different. Diffusion is, is a natural process. As a matter of fact, Mother Nature, Mother Nature created diffusion in order to make the world livable. 
because if it were not for the fusion, it would, set, it would be such chaos, you would not believe. You would not believe. Everything would go outright to, I mean, uh, as you can say, it would go, it would just totally get crazy. So diffusion helps to control things. Hayami was talking about diffusion in hydraulics. Introducing this, this, the effect of longitudinal diffusion caused by the mixing into the equation of continuity and assuming the mean flow taken over a suitable range to be steady and uniform, the differential equation of flood waves was derived. So he derived the second order diffusion, convection diffusion equation of flood waves for the first time in 1951, because Leichert and Whittem also did it, but they did it in 1955. And prior to that, nobody had done it. We had to wait for Kunch to 1969. It is an equation of diffusion containing a term of advection. Now, I had already told you that advection is the same or means the same as convection. And the reason why we use two, I don't know. I think that it has to do with the fact that there's various fields and subfields like computational fluid dynamics, computational mechanics, computational hydraulics, and they have a tendency by chance to use different terms and they start fighting between them as to what terms they should use. Right now, most people would agree that advection is used in compressible flow, while convection is used in incompressible flow. However, uh, Hayami was talking about incompressible flow. He was talking about floods, and he was still took, uh, looking, uh, calling it advection. So I don't know. I don't know why or how he did this. But suffice it to say at this point that advections advection in the context of, of these subjects is the same as convection, okay? As the equation is nonlinear, an approximate method of solution was discussed and solutions were obtained under several conditions. Now, there's an issue here of nonlinearity versus linearity. Is the world, is the equation nonlinear? And the answer is not quite. He made a mistake in here. I already told you, these guys make mistakes. The equation that he's working with is quasi-linear, according to mathematicians. The, the, the correct definition is quasi-linear. Quasi, as you guys probably know, in, in, in uh, Roman, I mean, Latin means almost. It means almost. So it's almost linear. So the problems that we're dealing with here are almost linear. And that's why they are solvable typically sometimes with linear solutions, as many people try to do. And we try to do too, everybody does try to do, because we believe and we know that the nonlinearity is mild. An approximate method solution was discussed, solutions were obtained. They explained the properties of flood waves, that is true. The approximate equation is linear. A flood of any form is therefore supposed to be composed of many elementary flood waves of simple character, unit graph or unit flood. Here, here is he's deviating into the unit graph theory which really kind of has nothing to do with, with, with his stuff. This gentleman is routing floods in canals. That's different than routing a flood in a watershed. There's three entities, watersheds, channels, and, and reservoirs. And they're completely, totally different. And if you want to learn about it, you can read my book. Chapter 8 is reservoirs, chapter 9 is channels, and chapter 10 is watersheds in my hydrology book. In very much detail, we go over that stuff. Okay, so he's talking about channels, and yet he's kind of confusing the issue with the unit graph of, of Sherman, 1932. I don't like that, but there's nothing I can do about it. I already told you, I'm reading this stuff with a sieve. I'm trying to see if, they're, if they are correct, because don't forget that these guys wrote, he, this guy wrote the stuff 70 years ago. He could not have known at the time what we know now. Okay, a method of computing the unit graph was described, and that's some of the results of our vision made an artificial unit flood on the Yellow River, etc. I'm not going to go any further. I already introduced you to the great Professor Hayami, who gave us the diffusion theory of flood waves. Now, Hayami, I'm not exactly sure how is it that in the literature is referred to, dif to diffusion analogy. My guess would be that people at the time were really surprised that this stuff was coming up, and they call it an analogy, meaning something similar to diffusion is what you're doing here when in fact there's no analogy it isn't the flood wave is a diffusion process there's no analogy with diffusion 
You know what I'm saying? Uh, linguistically, it's not an analogy. It is a process of diffusion. However, for the last 50 years, it was called analogy, kind of cutting it down a little bit. We don't like it and we uh, have not used it. But nevertheless, you see it in the literature, the diffusion analogy of Hayami. Okay, now, so that is what I'm going to say about Hayami. Now, the next person that we should call, talk about is Mr. Doug. Who is Mr. Doug? And I'm going to do a lot of uh, qualifications in here as we start reading Doug in here. Doug is, a, is an Irish professor. Uh, I do not know if he's still alive. He would have to be at least 20 years, at least if not 20 or even 30 years older than I am. Since I'm in my middle 70s, if this guy was alive, he would be more than 100. I don't, honestly don't think so, but I haven't checked. I haven't checked. One would have to check him out on Google and find out with any luck we find out. Uh, so Duke was a professor at, uh, I believe, in one of the major universities in Dublin, in Ireland. And he had written papers on, on floods. Surface flow in general, surface flow. Floods, little floods, big floods, uh, overland flow, stuff like that. He had worked 40, 50 years on this. And through the 50s, he was working, most of the stuff he was doing was in the 50s. So I'm given to understand that in the 50s, he must have been in his middle 30s. So they would put him, they would put him in the 20s. So if, if Duke is still alive, he, he could be on the order of 95 years old. Okay, so he was, he has a, such a good reputation. Um, he handled the lin, linear theory, the linear theory of, of hydrology. He called it the linear theory, or either he called it the linear theory or other people gave it the name, whatever. I think it was linear theory. The linear theory is a theoretical tool. Okay, it uses Laplace transforms and all kinds of theoretical mathematics to solve the problem of surface flow, which was good at the time, because he was doing this in the 50s. In the 50s, he had no way of, any, of uh, uh, accessing any computers. The computers started coming, started coming up in the early 60s, middle 60s. I think I already told you that uh, living in Peru, there was at least a, a five to 10 year lag. And the first time I heard or I had my hands on a computer was in the year 1966. 66 in Peru, but in the US it was like 56, like 10, uh, five, 10 years earlier. Okay, so uh, at the end of his career, he may have access to a computer, I'm sure he did, but not at the beginning. So he developed this linear theory of hydrologic systems, which was closed form, it was closed. It was not numerical, it's not discrete, it's closed form, as we will see later on. And uh, then um, he became very famous. He, he did good work, no question about it. As a matter of fact, we, we meaning I, have personally benefited from the work of Duke, and I will have a chance to explain to you that later on. We all learn from each other. All researchers learn from each other. Uh, so Duke um, was very famous in the late 50s, middle 60s, and throughout. And uh, the, um, the ARS, the ARS stands for Agricultural Research Service. They are an agency of uh, the mini uh, I was gonna say ministry, the, uh, the the agricultural department, the Department of Agriculture in the U.S. And they invited Mr. Duke, Professor Duke, in 1973, to give a series of lectures because he was a big guy. You know, we want to learn from this guy, see what he's saying. So they convinced him to come over to the U.S. and he came over to the U.S. and gave a series of lectures, which were later put into a book. And the book is called Linear Theory of Hydrologic Systems. I got a hold of the book early and I read it all. And I read chapter nine, I think, oh, maybe 10 times. 10 times, we were studying. We wanted to learn this stuff. Uh, I'm not gonna say that I learned it because he was using some style of math which is not my forte. And I felt that it was not, not necessary for me. In other words, time has gone, had gone by and I really wasn't not, not gonna need the tools that, that Duke had developed. In other words, they were old tools. However, that doesn't mean to say that whatever Duke said was not important. 
it was important. We were able to pick up a whole lot of stuff in the, in the mechanics part of it that we otherwise would not have picked up. And I'll explain to you later on. So uh, we read the Duke uh, paper, but again, I preface by my, by my uh, lecture by saying that I did not seek, nor I did understand everything he said. So I'm gonna leave it at that. And I already mentioned to you that it's not necessary for us to understand everything. We read a lot of stuff, we read with a sieve, whatever we can digest, we digest, that's exactly the way we do it. Okay, so, so you ask me later on to explain some of the things that Duke did. Duke did, I said, I'm sorry, I didn't do it. I don't know. Again, I repeat, so it'll be clear. The linear theory of hydrologic systems would have been good in the 80s, 60s, 50s and 60s, but not in the 90s when we were doing this work, 80s and 90s. They had gone passe, meaning they were late, not late, uh, old, okay? As a framework, they were good. So we're gonna be looking at, at the paper of Duke right now. Only lecture nine, which is the mathematical simulation of surface flow. Now we have done a career in this stuff, mathematical simulation of surface flow. So we had to read Duke and we had to kind of show it to you so that you, in case you're interested later on, you wanna to go to the background of things, early stuff, then you can go to Duke and you started already. Uh, of course, what you need to do in this case is buy the book which is not an easy thing to say, by the way. It's an ARS pub, and I do not believe that it circulates, but you can get it in the library and stuff. I have to have a copy because early I got a copy. It's an old copy, but a copy nevertheless. So I scanned the, the chapter nine, and I'm going to jump around chapter nine, hopefully make it a cogent presentation. Uh, but uh, you, have to, you have to be a little patient here. First of all, he's gonna divide this chapter into two parts, overland flow and channel flow, because that's a surface flow divides itself into overland flow and channel flow. Okay. Uh, there's also mixed overland flow. There's, there's nuances in there, mixed overland flow, and I'll describe that later on, but typically overland flow and channel flow are different. The channel flow has a hydrograph input and a hydrograph output. The overland flow has rain input in hydrograph output. That's the difference. Overland flow is a plane, a watershed. It's a two, perhaps even three dimensional process. Nobody in my mind has actually solved the three dimensional flow problem in overland flow. So the way we do it is like we do the open book, the open book of uh, Wooding. Uh, Wooding uh, was, a, I believe, a professor over in Australia. And um, he came up with the concept of the open book. The open book is an open book and it rains on top and then it collects in the middle like a book and then it drains and you figure out what the flow is. So it's not a channel, it's, a, it's an open book. So the open book is used extensively just about everywhere. Never mind that the flow is really not an open book. The flow is here and there, but that's the best thing we can do. All the other attempts to forego the open book have failed. HMS does open book. Uh, the other uh, EPA does open book. Everybody, because open book is, is a simple way to represent in the computer. It's not perfect, but then again, we are not seeking perfection. We cannot get perfection. Perfection is three dimensional flow anyway, and nobody's done it. Um, the word is, uh, in the street is that uh, the French had come up with a um, with a three-dimensional flow model, and that the Army Corps is, is very busily trying to do that too, but they haven't done it yet. Uh, it, it's a matter of, of months that maybe they'll announce this stuff, this stuff. And I don't know, I don't follow too much that. But the point is that the three-dimensional flow is in the making, and we'll eventually get there. In a few years, we'll get there. However imperfect it may be, we will get there because people are gonna sell the three-dimensional flow as if it were better than the two-dimensional flow. As they did when the two-dimensional flow came up, it was sold that, is, that it was better than the one-dimensional flow. Everything looks, looks like uh, good, you know, and they, they use that in order to sell it. So overland flow is the flow, it's hydrology as opposed to hydraulics. The channel flow is hydraulics, the overland flow is hydrology. Um, 
the, the equations were out there, and he's going to talk about the equations, but then the numerics of the overland flow, we had to wait until we had computers because nobody was doing the calculation of overland flow by hand. They would be, they would be crazy. It's too much, too long. So we had to wait until the 60s, middle 60s. It was Shaki at, um, there were three people, Shaki at, at Princeton, Will Heiser at Cornell, and Wooding out there in, in Australia. They were doing this numerical calculation of overland flow at about the same time, which was the middle 60s, the middle 60s. Those were the three pioneers. Shaki subsequently went on to work with the, with the National Weather Service. Uh, I believe he was at Bellsville, Maryland. He stayed there for 30 or 40 years. Um, he got involved in something else. He wasn't really into numerics even though his thesis was numerics, his PhD thesis at uh, Princeton. Uh, Will Heiser uh, got out of Cornell and went to Colorado State as a professor and stayed there for 30, 40 years, uh, associated also with ARS. He was with ARS, Agricultural Research Service. Subsequently, he retired. He's been around after 40, 50 years of career, he retired. And I, again, I don't know if Will Heiser is still alive. He's at least 20 years older than I am. Um, of uh, Wooding, I don't know too much, other than the fact I got to tell you this story because it's a cute story. Um, Wooding published in Australia. So I felt he was Australian. So many years ago, like 20 years ago, I wrote a, a paper of uh, contributions to hydrology and hydraulics, and I listed Wooding as an Australian because that, the data showed that he had published his stuff in Australia. How would I know that he was not from Australia? No way. But one day I got, a, I, I was taking the task. I was, I got a call or an email from somebody from New Zealand, some professor out there, some Joe, John Doe. And he said, Professor Pond, uh, thanks for recognizing my pal Wooding, but he's not from Australia, he's a New Zealander. <laughs> I happen to know because we went to school together. <laughs> I said, oh, oh boy, that data I didn't know. So I fixed it. I fixed it on the spot. I, you know, I had no reason of knowing that, of, of thinking that that was a wrong piece of data. So I changed it. The wooding, I believe, originated in New Zealand, but went to Australia and got his PhD out there. So that's Mr. Wooding, the third gentleman in this field of numerical calculation of overland flow. And we have in here the, the, the schematic, the Q, the, the Q, the, x plus the y dt that is the continuity equation for per unit of width and this r is the source the lateral inflow per unit of area in other words that is the rain the rain is the lateral inflow so in other words in overland flow the rain is very important it's an intrinsic part of the calculation while in open channel flow the lateral inflow is not that important because the inflow is coming from upstream right it is true that in the real world, you're gonna connect. You're gonna connect the upstream with the downstream and so on and so forth and try to pursue the water as it flows downstream. It's fine and it can be done in models. We have, we have done that, well, not technically, no, because this would amount to mixing hydraulics, hydraulics with hydrology. That is hard to do. The fact that that cannot be done readily is for the Army Corps to divide their models into Hegras hydraulics and HMS hydrology. And they're not going to mix it. They, they're distinct features that separate those two. Okay. Uh, for one thing, they, they included uh, the St. Venan equations, the Danny Fred solution into Hegras, but they never did it to HMS. And the issue is what the question would be why? And the answer is very simple. The, the dynamic wave equation is so complicated and so subject to inexistency, if you know what I mean, that it cannot be, doesn't have to be there, or that typically is not there, that there is no reason to increase the complexity of the hydrology calculation by adding dynamic wave. And that has been shown around the world, by the way. I've been around, well, I've not been around the world. I actually visited maybe 20 countries in my career and where I talk to people, they say, well, we tried it and we, we couldn't make it work. So we dumped it. I'm talking about the Danny Fred solution. Okay. It's got a lot of problems, Danny Fred solution. And I'll talk about that later. 
we'll, we'll, we'll compare, we'll actually compare the masking of kinds with the dynamic wave solution. And we'll, it, it will both come out reasonable. As a matter of fact, I was just doing that this morning. We're working on it when one of our students were working with that. So this morning we were talking about that. So the dynamic equation for two dimensional over land flow, this we have not derived. We jumped over this and didn't derive it. This term in here, it's called the, uh, the, the momentum component to the side flow, the, the slow, the flow from the side. Rate of lateral inflow per unit area is R. So that has, we haven't derived it. So it's just a new equation that I'm presenting to you now. Okay, so that's the equation. Okay, and I'm going to jump around in here because obviously we don't have the time, but let me just cut over here. First, let me mention Izar. Who is Izar? Izar was a gentleman that was working in the late twenties and older gentleman. I happen to have the good luck of having met Izar when at the age of 93, he attended a conference somewhere out there, I believe it was in the East Coast, New Jersey or somewhere, maybe 30 years ago. He was already pretty old. But he was one of the first ones to calculate the overland flow using a conceptual method, not like Shaki or, or Wilheiser. They, they were using numerics because they were doing this in the 60s. Isa was working in the 40s. His late, late, later publications are in the 40s. Izzard was given the job to calculate the drainage of the airports that were being built throughout the United States. You figured out how much flow and how we can do channels so they, you know, they, they will collect the water so that the water doesn't sit around in the, in the plane, in the airplanes. I mean, not in the airplanes, in the, on the road and um, on the airports, okay? So he did that work reasonably well and he's recognized for that because he was one of the first ones to do that, to do that. What, I say one, because there was another gentleman by the name of Horton, who was kind of competing with her, Izzard, doing this also, this kind of work. <laughs> Jokingly, I would say today that I think Izzard was doing the work and he was getting paid. Horton was, I don't know, Horton was, I don't know his, Horton's employment, but at any rate, Horton is a big guy. He's considered to be the father of hydrology in the US because Horton got into many fields. He's got a lot of formulas. The Horton formula of infiltration, for one thing. Um, Horton also did the kind of work that Izzard was doing, developing a conceptual model, an analytic model, to calculate the overland flow problem. That's where they get in here. Okay, so the first, as, as uh, Duke says, the first approach to the solution is classical, in classical hydrology, Etc. here because the method is first proposed by Horton and subsequently by Izzard, okay, it may be referred to Horton Izzard. It's similar. The difference is that Horton decided to use a different exponent. Izzard used three and Horton used two. And why is that? I believe that Izzard was look, working at airports and he felt that three was more appropriate for airports while Horton was working in natural conditions and he felt that three was too high and he reduced that to two. It will be apparent or it will be more more significant later on when we discuss exactly what the nature of these co exponents is three as opposed to two okay okay how what is the overland pro hydrograph here is an interesting and, and correct figure hydrograph of overland flow the overland flow goes like this it's a plane and eventually achieves a peak or a, a plateau and when when it stops raining it comes down it rains up again. This is the rain in here. When it, the rain is over here, when it stops raining, it comes down. Starts raining again, it goes up, and then it stops raining and it recedes like this. So this is the a calculated uh, overland flow. So all the overland flow calculations do this. They reach a plateau. As long as the rain lasts more than the time of equilibrium, which could be also referred to as time of concentration, okay? So, and likewise in here, you can see a, a plateau and then another plateau and then a recession. Or here, I don't like, and I don't know why they have this sharp peak in there. The sharp peaks are usually an indication that they were doing numerics. If this is a numerical, a numerical calculation, then I understand the, the essence or the meaning of the peak. 
If it's an analytic, I wouldn't like it because analytics supposed not to not to have that peak in there. That peak shows instability, numerical instability, which we will talk about extensively later on, and I will show you how that is calculated. So now you know more or less the the shape of the overland flow. It's fairly simple. How to calculate it? Well, here is where Horton comes in, and he starts assuming that the outflow is a is a, a a polynomial function of the storage of the amount of volume that's being kept uh at equilibrium the alpha equilibrium storage at equilibrium and then a, a and c are coefficient and exponents and then horton proceeds to do this calculation and he ends up with something like this which is by the way explained in detail in chapter four of my book Okay, and from here we go, can be solved analytically for values of C1, 2, and 3, or C4, and for ratios, okay, 3 halves or 4 thirds. Actually, this equation can be solved analytically for any exponent, but, but you'll have to do it, and it is not easy matter, okay. In 1997, I believe, myself with associates, decided to come up with a graph because this guy Duke didn't do it and I'll show you he didn't do it he showed three but he didn't show all six of them let me try to see if I can get there right there right he shows c1 c2 c3 rising and recession and when I saw this I said huh he didn't complete it you have to do uh c uh, five thirds you have to do three halves, three halves, five thirds. And you have to do another one, I believe, or maybe it's just, that's just it. I don't remember right now, but there are at least two missing in there. The, the seven, I'm sorry, not the seven, the Manning and the Chessy exponents, uh, three halves and five thirds. So then we decided to do this calculation to prove that he's correct and stuff. And we came up with a book with a paper that I'm going to talk briefly later on when we finish here that does this calculation. I engaged a professor of mathematics who was a friend of mine. And also I engaged a student. Interestingly, this student was Summer Hassening. Now Summer Hassening, 24 years later, has now become, has a leading job or position over at the county, I believe. He's the boss out there number two or number three. I don't know if you guys work for the county, you know, or you have heard of Summer Hassening. Nobody? No, you don't hear it. But if you work for the county, you would know that she's the boss. Yeah, for San Diego. San Diego. Cal Can county Water yeah. Authority. Yeah, County Summer Hassening, right? Mm -hmm. She helped me write this paper that I'm talking about. 20, oh, okay. 24 years ago. Yep, interesting, huh? Yeah. Yeah, she really rose high. She had a lot of, I guess you could say, guts. Uh, at any rate, Summer did this. Well, she did what I told her, like I said. I told her to do this, and she did it. And she did it greatly. As a matter of fact, there is a little anecdote in regard to this that I, I love. I um, gave um, Summer the, um, the job of finding the integrals, because this is analytic. It's not numeric. It's anal totally analytic. you got to work with integrals. And she worked at the integrals and uh, and she came up, oh, oh no, the first thing she did, she was trying to shortcut. So she used a software pro problem or software program that gives you the integrals outright without having to calculate them. And then he came up with the water moving upstream. In one of the cases, the water is moving upstream. The other four were fine. And I said, you know, Summer, I'm sorry, but I mean, there's something wrong with this. The water that's not going to move up slow, no matter what you do, um, particularly in a case like this, uh, it would move up slope if you had a channel that had an, uh, a slope that was negative. And that happens, but the slope has to be small. It cannot be too large. And in an in, in a, in a overland flow, usually the slopes are large. So I said, you go back. And, and she said, well, I got this equation from such and such software program. I said, well, obviously they're wrong. You go ahead and integrate the whole thing from principle, basic principles. And she did. 
Two weeks later, she came back and said, Professor Panza was a minus, there should have been a plus. <laughs> like that. And she put the plus in there and everything worked nicely and everything I'll show it to you later on. So it's a good story on how you, you cannot uh, trust the software programs 100% because human, a mistake is human. People do make mistakes. Okay, so having seen this recessions, the rising and recessions, I'll show, I'll show you the complete uh, model or the complete equation later on. Okay, so uh, now he goes on in here to continue to, you don't have to pay too much attention to this because like I said, this is the conceptual model of Izard. And by the way, this, this problem has been completely solved by ourselves and put as a calculator and I will show you the calculator later on. You never have to do this problem again with a calculator. I mean, you could if you wanted to, but why? Why are you going to spend time on it? Who's going to pay for it? Nobody's going to pay for it. Usually the consultants don't like to pay for research, let alone development. They pay for practical applications. Okay, so we got in here. Uh, he's talking a little bit about Wilheiser. I believe he's talking, yeah, Wilheiser. Typical rising hydrograph found by Wilheiser and Liggett. Wilheiser is an interesting gentleman. He married to the dynamic, uh, to the kinematic wave, and he never lost track of it. He somehow could not get into anything else. That is unfortunate. Dave, Dave is my friend. Uh, uh, I met him uh, several, uh, several times through the course of my career. He used to have an office right next to mine at Colorado State. Uh, but that's just the way it is. Um, Will Heiser developed the kinematic flow number, which is this 15B in here which is featured in my book, by the way, chapter four, section four, two of my book. So if you want more detail, you can go in there. So he developed this K, he called it K, which was the slope times the length of the plane over the fruit number times the depth. And he said that this number had to be a certain amount in order for the flow to be kinematic. So this is kind of similar to my uh, kinematic wave applicability criterion, but ours is, different because ours is for a channel not for a plane so he's using the length of the plane because the length of the plane was his limit his physical limit he had no more plane than the length of the plane well we had uh, a channel and we had a, a wave wavelength in a wave period so we were using the wave period so basically our applicability criterion is similar it does kind of the same job but not on the same person or not on the same uh, problem. He is talking about applicability of kinematic waves in overland flow situations for which L, the length of the plane is defined. We are talking of applicability of kinematic waves on channel flow situations for which the wavelength or wave period, we, because you can convert from one to the other, they are defined. So we don't have a wavelength, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have a, a a plain link to deal with. But nevertheless, we did our work based on his. We knew that he hadn't done it completely because his job was not to calculate channel flow. His job was calculate overland flow, which is entirely different, as you can see. But he gave us the idea that we needed to calculate that, and we came out kind of close. So that is the, uh, the computation of the rising hydrograph, okay? He's also talking about the linear reservoirs, the nonlinear reservoirs. We have done extensive calculations on the linear reservoirs. And we will talk about that brief when, when the time gets, gets uh, when we get there, we, I will explain in detail the linear, the linear reservoirs, which are used by a whole lot of people in the models. When I went to Brazil in 1979, uh, they hired me for two months to go to the field and do the addition model to the general model. They, they had a general model of the entire Pantanal Basin, and they wanted to do a, a modification or an addition, a complement to it. So they hired me to do the complement. So they gave me two months, and we did it. In two months, we complemented uh, the SAR model, which they were using. It's a Army Corps of Engineers model. But interestingly, the SAR model is not a Davis model. It is a Portland model because, as you know, the Army Corps has districts all over the United States and the various districts kind of 
sometimes times times don't see eye, whatever it is, I don't know, I can't talk about it. But the point is that Army Corps of Engineers Davis, California, is not the Army Corps of Engineers Portland District. And the Portland District developed very early in the game, if you want to call it a game, back in the 50s, they developed the SAR model, stream flow synthesis and reservoir regulation, because they needed to model the Columbia. And this was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Davis came up in the set, uh, 68, 70, so they could not have used Davis at the time. And Davis, in the 70s, they were just beginning. They could not have done it anyway. Nevertheless, the agency that perseveres or, or is being used this day is the Davis lab. And the Portland district has faded, basically, as far as their computational capabilities. I believe what happened, I could be wrong on this, but let me say so. There was a, there, there had to be a shift from, from a character cell to GUI. Okay, what, what does that mean? Anybody venture an opinion, Andrea? Margo? GUI what is, is that just like graphic cell? interface? Huh? What? Graphic interface? Yeah, right. Before we had GUI, graphical user interface, we had character cell, although not many people recognize it, but that was a fact, character cell. We started having character cell computers with uh, the so-called um, uh, cathode ray, ray two, right? Remember that? No, you don't remember, you're too young. CRTs, the CRTs were all over the place. Cathode ray two. But then 20 years later, they were super, uh, replaced by the flat, the flat TVs and the flat computers. Now, whether we have a flat computer, it's only an inch, an inch thick. Well, at that time, it was like 15 to 8, 20 inches thick. That's progress, right? So the, this and the cathode, the the cathode ray tube computers were operated under um, under um, operating system that was based on letters. So everything was letters, vector, what I call a vector. And then in 19 early 1990s we had a shift to the graphical user interface. And at the time, it was represented very strongly by the Windows program. Windows means Microsoft, right? But I should set the record straight. Microsoft did not invent Windows. Uh -huh. They took it and they ran with it. But prior to, prior to Microsoft Windows, we had X Windows, which we use, by the way. But then X Windows was with um, companies that have bit the dust. Well, Microsoft is still there. So they, I guess you could say they are the winners. Okay. So we shifted in, in the middle 90s to, from character cell to, to, to GUI. Character cell used cards. Can you believe that? I'm old enough that I have used cards. We had a, the project that we did in 1979 used cards, right? Cards, computer cards. But that was old. That's history. That's long. I'm not going to waste your time on it. So the point is that in 1995, uh, GUI was implemented throughout graphical user interface. At that time, I'm going to tell you a story because I lived through this. I was re getting ready to write the second edition of my book. I felt that it needed to be done. A good book usually is re-edited every 10 years. I said, I'm going to start working on this. So I went over to Arlen Feldman at Davis, who's a friend of mine. And I said, Arlen, uh, what are you guys doing with Heck one and heck two. And he says, back burner, Pons. He said, we're putting it in the back burner because we're coming out with the GUI versions. I said, when? I was surprised. I knew this was coming, but not that quick. I said, when? He says, 1998. And in 1998, sure enough, five, three years later, they released the heck RAS that replaced HEC2 and HS, HMS that replaced HEC1. So HEC2, HEC1 were not to be considered anymore. There were some changes. There are some minor changes between an HEC2 and HECRAS. So technically, if anybody wants to use HEC2, they are, I guess you could say, behind, old, right? It's RAS, the one that is being used right now. Right or wrong, because that's what the Army does. They impose their stuff because everybody favors them for various reasons. Okay, so that's the story. But the reason why I, I got involved in that was that I wanted to say that uh, that the Army Corps Portland District never got into GUI. That was a kiss of death. There was a kiss of death of the SAR model. 
because nobody's going to go back to and do this stuff. So that's another story there. So I'm steady flowing open channels in here. Now, this I already talked about extensively. So he's going to talk about that, the equations and so forth, right? The solution of the routing problem. And then here he starts mentioning the, the names, the Muskinga method of McCarthy. I checked this morning, he's got an error. The McCarthy published is an unpublished manuscript that was published in 1938, according to Chow. Now, I have no way of knowing if Chow or Du is right. It's either 38 or 39. I am going to give Chow the benefit of the doubt because uh, Professor Chow was a very hardworking gentleman and very meticulous. So I'm going to guess in here, I could be wrong, that McCarthy was 38 and therefore Duke is wrong in citing McCarthy. But at any rate, he talks about the Muskingum method of McCarthy. Uh, he talks uh, lag and route method of Meyer, who, by the way, I don't know too much about and I don't really care because I have the best method. Why should I care about the other number two methods? Diffusion and of Hayami, do you see? Diffusion and of Hayami, a method of history. And the successive routing of Kalinin and Milyukov, that's another method that um, made by the Russians. You can see the Russians name in there, which I don't know too much. I have read about it, but I don't know too much. Like I said, I got the best tool. Why should I look at the others? But that's at the time, at my time. But at the time where Duke did his work in the 50s and in the 60s, he had no way of knowing that Maskingam Kaj was coming. He didn't even mention it. Okay. Never mind, he wrote this in 73. 73. So he wrote it four years after Kaj. But Kaj wrote his paper in 69, and there were a few years before nobody really knew it or read it. It was a French journal anyway. Excuse me for saying that, but that's the truth. Okay. So, so Duke doesn't mention Kaj. And he actually comes up with the Kanji equation. So I'm led to believe, uh, piecing one thing with another, that the equation that Kanji developed were already known by Du. But he didn't call him Maskingam Kanji. So leaving the credit aside, at this point, we don't really care. We should call him Maskingam, Maskingam Du or whatever. The fact is they are being called around all over the world as Maskingam Kanji. Okay? Usual credit is a diffuse subject talk, to talk about diffusion. It changes. Okay, so we have in here now the Chessy formula. This is interesting. He applies a small perturbation the way we did it in our equation, but we apply the von Neumann method. He gets this equation, which is the equation of Deime, which as he says, the Deime Frenchman, uh, the work of Deime on mass published in 38 was not followed up. And the linearization solution were developed independently by Duke in 1965. So Duke is claiming that he developed the equation in 1965, this linearization equation, which is like a telegraph stop, similar to what we have, only that we did it not in partial differentials. We did it in algebraic, but it's kind of the similar thing, similar process. You take two equations and you combine them into one, and that one is representative of the two equations. It's exactly what he did in here. Okay, so now finally, he's going to apply his own methodology. And like I said, we don't claim expertise on the linear methods of do. We just want do in order to find out what he can tell us that is clear for us in terms of what we know. So he developed his, and this is where he, where, where the clarity comes in. That's why I like to do. He came up with the, using his linear theory, which uses, uses Laplace transforms, Okay, and you have heard of the Laplace transforms. And I'm sure anybody of you wanted to get into Laplace transforms, it would take you a few days, but it will, you will get in there. I've done Laplace transforms when I was young. But the point is that we're not doing, we haven't done this for 50 years, so we're not gonna do it now. But the point is that Duke did get the so-called cumulants of the Laplace transport, transport form, and he got the velocities in here. The first moment he revealed seven right there. Seven is 1.5, so he revealed that. The length, the velocity. The second moment, he revealed the Kanch formula with the added situation that he's got this one minus root number squared over four. Kanch didn't have this because Kanch was doing the diffusion wave. He is doing the dynamic wave, complete dynamic wave. So he had this multiplier added to the Kanch. Of course, he doesn't call it Kanch because like I, I already told you why, okay? I am not sure. I don't think he knew, but I could be wrong. I, I don't know everything. But the point is that this is the Kant formula, but with the addition of one minus F squared over four. 
And he even goes into the third moment and the fourth moment. So he's really kind of in the moment the issue. Like I already told you earlier, we never got into the third moment yet in practice, let alone the fourth moment. Okay. We're, st we're working on it. I is not my job anymore. I'm, I'm, it's over for me. Okay. But the point is that um, uh, here he's talking about the Klai Sedon Law, right? The 1.5 times the Klai Sedon Law. Perfect. He agrees. The Klai Sedon Law pops up everywhere because this is the truth. There's no other truth that the Klai Sedon Law. Uh, Sedon said that in his paper. He says this is the, the formula that the river will conform. Okay. So the next page in here, then he, I'm proceeding in here to, to, Okay, uh, before I do that, I'm, I'm going to go back in here now to tell you a story here. Okay, he identified over here this multiplier, which Kanch didn't have. And we, later on in 1981, wrote a paper talking about this. And we said that this was correct, but the proper formulation was not 1 minus fruit number square over 4, but 1 minus Vedernik of number square. We said that that this was specialized to the fruit number in the four, but in gen, in general, the true expression for this formula is one minus Vedernik of number square, because in his case, the the fruit number square over four was equal to Vedernik of number square. So we introduced the Vedernik of number into the calculation of the diffusivity. He had introduced it, but not the Vedernik of. He introduced the fruit number. So as you can see how researchers work with each other, kind of adding, uh, aiding themselves up in trying to get at the, at the truth. So finally, at the end, he does some calculations in here, which I'm not exactly sure exactly what he does, but I do want to say, look at this, we used all our, all our time here. At the end, he talks about something that is very important for us. He uses the Thomas problem as an example of what he's going to do to show his calculation. Why? Because the Thomas problem over the year has become the ruler with which everybody tests their models. Thomas was a gentleman that wrote a paper in the U.S. in 1934, and his methodology is a little bit involved, and at this point nobody even pays attention to it. But they do talk about the example of the Thomas, and that's what I'm going to have you guys do. I'm going to have you guys work with the Thomas problem. It's right here. That's the rating. It's a, it's a Chessy rating, a white, a white channel Chessy rating, and the inflow is this. So examine this formula because we're going to use it later, which corresponds to the inflow used by Thomas in his classical paper. The channel length is 200 and 500. I'm going to talk about it, and then I'm going to give you a calculation. That's going to be the, that's going to be the second or third problem, I believe. I don't recall at this point. And that's where you're going to get your feet wet because you're going to do calculations. However, though, I do want to say that the calculations you're going to do are with Excel because we recognize that Excel is the, the tool of choice of engineers. Engineers don't use Fortran anymore, although there's a percentage of that. I would say 1% or 2% use Fortran. For whatever reason, hard for me to understand, they don't use other methods. They're coming up, but they're slow, extremely slow. I wrote... My first calculator on the record in the year 2004, 2003, 2004, and we've since been doing calculators because once you have a pattern, you can reproduce the pattern ad infinitum, you know, but forever. You can use the box, same box. Throw this equation, put another equation in there. And we have done calculations on the web online that range from the rational method, which is C times I times A, which is three, three products, to calculations of um, of uh, dissolved oxygen SAG, in which case we do like 30, 40 million calculations. And we're gonna, I'm gonna have you do work for those of you that are taking 633. We're gonna do some work with that, the, with the, the dissolved oxygen SAG curve, which is the curve that, that happens when, uh, when sewage is, is uh, placed in the river. The dissolved oxygen, which is usually typically eight or nine, drops down. And if you put a lot of sewage, you can drop down, drop down to zero. And at that point, then all the aerobic life disappears. 
and you're taken over by the anaerob. So that's an environmental problem, which we are going to talk about eventually in the other class that I'm teaching. So I do want to introduce you to this problem, which is a Thomas problem. Review it, because we're going to work on it soon, sooner than later. And, and then that's basically it. And here he's actually comparing. He's actually comparing multiple Maskinga method, three parameter models. He's actually getting to the three parameter models of Maskinga. That's fascinating and interesting. I don't have the energy to do this anymore, but I'm leaving it open there because we believe that the three parameter Maskinga model, it's not in practice there yet. And then he's talking about the same things that we've been talking. The, uh, for delta function velocity equal to the dynamic wave speed, see he calls the dynamic wave speed the speed of Lagrange. So he's diverting from Fred in here. Obviously diverting from Fred. He he did this work in the 60s. Fred did not show up until 73. Fred is the guy that messed things up by calling the mixed dynamic kinematic wave, he called it dynamic wave for simplicity. And he really messed up because he superseded the Lagrange name for dynamic wave which was in the middle of the spectrum. Typically, the tendency is for them not to exist. So if they don't exist, we don't need to calculate them. OK. So finally, the he talks about the diffusion coefficient. Look at this. This is fascinating. He, he finally talks about the D, and he puts his product in here, which is an interesting product. But I do not believe that Duke knew anything about Bedernikov. I do not believe. Not everybody knows everything. That's why he never mentioned it. I, when I wrote the S paper in 1977, I didn't know either. Even though Vatanikov wrote his paper in 1946. You know, you, you do the best you can. But we didn't know either. But in 1991, we got smart. By that time, 14 years later, and we discovered the Vatanikov number, and we realized how important it was. Vatanikov had been hidden by Vatanikov himself who wrote a paper that is largely unreadable and confusing. So he did that in 1946. Then in 1948, out of luck, total luck, there was a gentleman working at the US by the name of Powell who discovered the Vedernikov out of Russia, namely because the Israeli had translated uh, English and this guy Powell read it and he says, this is a new concept, we might as well call it Vedernikov number. So the name Vedernikov number dates back to 1948. And this, that's prior to this calculation, but he never mentioned it. The Duke never mentioned it. Until I came in 1991, and I'll talk extensively about that, and discovered that the Vedernico was not a difficult subject. It was actually an easy subject. And I don't want to talk too much about it because it will be clear when we get there. So I really pulled a veil out of Vedernikov number. It became easy. With the, with the fruit number, though they are considered to be the, the two pillars of hydraulics and hydrology. You cannot talk about one without talking about the other. There are two. There, you can't, like I said, I repeat, you cannot talk about the fruit number without immediately talking about the Vedernikov number. Fra, uh, Chow made the mistake. The mistake Chow made was that he, of course, didn't understand Vedernikov. I don't blame him. He was writing this in 1959. It was obscure. It was Russian, you know, other part of the world and so forth. So he decided to hide it. He hid it in chapter eight. He put Vedernikov at the last section in chapter eight. He put, he put Prude in the first section in chapter one. So they were totally separated. As a result of that, hardly anybody, I know every hydraulic engineer owns the Chow book, but hardly anybody has read chapter eight. He called it theoretical subjects, theoretical concepts. It was a kiss of death. I have a story on that on the web. Uh, we, are, we are knowledgeable on this subject. And um, right now I have a minute. There were, I was in Brazil, no, in Bolivia, in the field, and I ran into this guy. And you, you guys have taken an open chance with me, have heard me tell this story. And I said, uh, John, what are you doing? No, no, he said. Pause, what are you doing? I said, I just wrote a paper on the Vedernikov number because it was 1991. Actually, it was 1990 because it takes a year to publish. And he says, the Wabit, the what number? And I realized he, like everybody else, didn't know. 
So I said, but you're a professor of hydraulics somewhere out there. He says, yeah, I've been teaching hydraulics for 30 years or 20, something like that. He, he's my age. So this would have been 20 years ago. He would have been 55. Okay. So yeah, I've been teaching. Well, it's in Chao. It's, in, it's there. And he says, Chao. At that point, he realized he was in trouble because he taught with Chao. And he said, Chao, where? I said, well, in chapter eight. I, at the, I really got to nail him, nailing him down. He said, what chapter is that? And I said, well, the one that called theoretical subjects. And he, he said with a grin, he says, oh yeah, that's the chapter we skip, right? So if the professor skipped the subject or the topic, you think the students are gonna read it? No, because nobody reads it. Last story, I have one minute here. There's a gentleman in town whose name I don't wanna mention. Top hydraulic engineer in town. I met with him 10 years ago. And I said, well, we're working on the Vedernik of number. He said, the what number? The same thing. <laughs> He's a top hydraulic engineer in town. I said, uh, I, I knew wh wh where I was. I said, oh, yeah, right. You don't know because you don't know. Nobody knows this, but the child hit it. We don't know why or how he hit it, but he hit it. And he said, oh, really, to be honest with you, it must be something that we don't use, he said. <laughs> I said, not really. It's important. It's just that just because you don't use it doesn't mean that, uh, just because you don't know, it doesn't mean that you don't use it. At any rate, the point was that it's a largely a hidden subject until we uncovered it in 1991. But it has been 20, 30 years. It's been 30 years and it's still not uncovered completely, unfortunately. So it is my job to tell you about the Vedernik of Number. So that from now on, you know, and they can't uh, pull a fast one on you. Actually, the Vedernik of Number is the subject of that topic that I have in there that is called research, label research, topic 18, I think. That's all about the Vedernik of Number because we've been doing research on this subject. So I'm going to stop there. I exceeded my time uh, by one minute. So thank you. So next week, okay, let me go back in here just to show you what's coming up. Okay, so we covered this ground in here. So when I come back, I'll have to cover, I'll have to, this is just a reference. I'll have to cover A13, A13, and then we move on to the work that we're gonna do next week. Okay, thank you very much. At this point, I do wanna cut over here, stop share, and I'll see you Monday at the usual time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.